I didn't right. break everything. You always break everything. That's your prerogative. I only break most things. <laughs> okay. We'll qualify it with the most. That's fair. And That's I don't, fair. you know, I don't really like to think about it as like active destruction. It's more like um, integrity tests. I like that. You're you're doing software development testing, QA testing for Zencaster. Doing what I can to break it because somebody has to. <laughs> you know that somebody's going to be you. Do you do you have a person in your life that is kind of like if they can make the technology work, you know it's bulletproof? Like just someone who is somehow like physically allergic to technology. Do you have that person in your life? I'm talking to him right now. God damn it. I walked right into it. You, I can't even be you mad. You shade right into that. <laughs> well, I'm here. Now, I, that is my sister is the one who is just complete. Like somehow in, in the genetic lottery, I got all the tech and she got zero of it. Um, which, which would explain why she's been a lifelong Mac user. Because it does at least make things relatively easy. So but, shots yeah. fired this early in the episode. Listen, it's it's just the way it is. And so she she teaches kindergarten, which is in theory very low tech. But uh, we were talking last week, and she was just telling me about the nightmare of when COVID happened, and suddenly she had all this technology foisted upon her. Right. And so the technology liaison at her school basically made her. I won't say the post he, she was the tester. If he wrote up instructions and, or some sort of tutorial to use something and my sister could grok it and do it, then he knew he was good across the entire school. <laughs> that's a, that's a dubious honor. Let's put it that way. I, she makes no bones about it. This is not a point of contention or embarrassment. She's just like, no, I am physically allergic to technology i break whatever i touch so if you can make something that i don't break you're probably good for like 99 percent of the population i know All thyself right. you know yeah i think that's the main takeaway <laughs> main takeaway uh yes we that and don't swim 30 that. minutes after eating <laughs> well yeah i mean that that was on the on the rosetta stone just below know thyself was, you know, don't swim until 30 minutes have elapsed. Though so they called I it mean, something. You could just keep it, make it more simple and just don't swim. Water is our enemy, despite being We've most out of it for a reason. <laughs> it's true. And I'm not going back. Oh, dear. I just imagine, you know, 400 billion years ago or whatever, you know, whatever first protozoa moved out of the water was like, fuck seaweed. That stuff's gross. It's so gross. It's and that's it, how life started. I won't say it's the worst thing about like swimming in the ocean because when the sometimes there's just a ton of little jellyfish and those are worse than seaweed because you can feel them all around you. And you know, most you of say them it like that, it sounds super gross. It feels super gross. <laughs> <laughs> My middle one won't even go in the ocean if we're having a a culling of the transparent jellyfish, which happens about once or twice a year on the Jersey Shore. I, I think Snooky's involved somehow. <laughs> Use your imagination or don't <laughs> really. I'm gonna go with the I'm gonna go with the latter on that one. Okay. Hello, alleged human, and welcome to the Chaos Lever Podcast. My name is Ned, and I'm definitely not a robot. I do not have an immature and insatiable thirst for power and possessions. I have simpler ambitions. You know, I merely want to bring peace and tranquility to the world. And if necessary, I will destroy anything or anyone that stands in the way. But did I say destroying? I meant recalibrating into their component atoms. Don't run. It won't help anyway. Hi, Chris. So it's good that we're doing this one remote, huh? <laughs> As is our want. We haven't done one in person in a while. It's true. It's true. On account of you it's getting a fault, real job now. 
what what's that all about? <sighs> I think that really said it all. More than words. <sighs> so, so you had a thing. And you wrote stuff. I did. And it's it's I one of your almost favorites. had another thing, but Uh-oh. that was shockingly even more esoteric and boring. So to save everybody, I decided mm. on this one. You're going to punt that to me next week. It's what you're saying. <laughs> Here, go make this interesting. So, yeah, we are going to talk about OWASP releasing an update to the API security top 10. Buckle up. Those were some words that you used. I, I recognized about 50% of them. That's better than average. <laughs> sure. So let's, yeah, let's go ahead and do some background on the sentence that I just made. And uh, mm. hopefully we'll fill in the blanks here. Okay. So question number one, what is an OWASP and what do they do? Right. OWASP is an acronym that stands for Open Web Application Security Project, which is a lot more words. So this is why everybody sticks with OWASP. <laughs> True. So we can do that, right? You agree? I, I, I agree. That is fine. Okay. So OWASP is an open source community of security researchers dedicated to a simple cause, finding categorizing, and counting all of the common security problems people can and will encounter on the internet. They are most famous for their top 10 list, just top 10, mm -hmm. which is dedicated to bringing awareness to major issues that web app developers will face. This one, which is the one that we are not talking about, that one, the one that we're not talking about is more or less based on websites and website adjacent online properties but the list is still on the general side of security, kind of on purpose. For example, the number one issue identified by the OWASP top 10 right now is broken access control. How right. do they define that? They define it as, quote, violation of the principle of least privilege or deny by default, bypassing access control checks by modifying the URL, improper elevations of privilege. It goes on. But you get the idea. Yeah, so the, that is more general. It's not speaking to a specific exploit or a way to take advantage of this failing. It's just this failing exists, and it usually has something to do with someone, you know, modifying the URL to bypass what would be like the login page where you'd get your initial token or cookie. Right. And, you know, that list has been a while, around for a while, and it is aimed at web apps, but because of its general nature, it is clearly applicable to a lot more than just your online gambling website. Mm -hmm. Now, fun fact, the most current version of the big list is from 2021. But if you ask ChatGPT, it will lie to you and tell you that the most current version is from 2017. Don't listen to everything the internet tells you. Especially ChatGPT. Yeah. I hadn't, so what I really should do is like, I got to set up some kind of a script that does an automated bake off of every single asinine question I come up with and see how wrong they all are, but in different flavors. <laughs> I think that would be fun. Yeah. Make that happen. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, the original big OWASP top 10 is generic. In order to be more specific, OWASP also started up another top 10 list. That's the one we're going to talk about today. The API security top 10. Mm. You want to, you want to guess what that, that security top 10 list is about? Uh, GRPC. So close. Final answer. Oh. APIs. So <laughs> what's an API? What is an you API? You might be wondering quietly to yourself. Uh, you know, I do hear the term bandied around a lot, especially with the advent of Web 2.0. But I think uh, it's a term that gets used fast and loose a lot. So maybe we should correct. put some parameters around it. Yep. API stands for Application Programming Interface. 
And basically what they exist to do is provide plumbing for the internet. Connect one site to another Mm -hmm. in a programmatic fashion. You know that gambling website that you just can't close the tab on, Ned? You know how it talks to your bank? Via an API. Mm -hmm. It is not a connection that the average user will ever see or care about, but it's there, and as you can imagine, it's super important. Mm -hmm. After all, you can't lose $2,500 playing four simultaneous hands of blackjack online at 3 o'clock in the morning after your job gave the primo contract to Steve, even though you were the one that did all the legwork, but I guess that's not important because Steve is the boss's nephew. <laughs> Hit me! I know it's a 17 against a 6 and the card says I should stand, but damn it, I need to feel alive. Wow. <clears throat> do, you need, what, um, do you need a minute? Do you, what was do the you question need a- again? Like five in a juice box? We can do that for you. <laughs> oh, I need a juice box. We oh, all <clears throat> need anyway. It. Oh, oh. anyway, okay. <clears throat> APIs. That's that's yeah. So cool. The point is API security is super important too. In fact, according to Hacker One, after the websites themselves, the APIs that connect them are the number two attack vector. <laughs> On the internet. Mm. So so that's bad. Could be. And those connections, because they are invisible, like I said, a lot of people don't even know they exist. So in order to bring them a little more into the light, OWASP created this API security top 10. The first list came out in 2019. They put out sort of a minor adjustments in 2021. And now... The 2023 list is out for public comment with a stated final release date of uh, soon, 2023 for sure, probably. Maybe. We'll see. So, okay. That's who they are. That's what they're talking about. What's on the list? So. This is an interesting one because one thing that's happened is OWASP is changing the way they approach this list. There are a few new categories in 2023 that collate issues from the 2019 list. There are a couple of completely net new issues, which that collation made room for. And, of course, there are a few that have the most depressing categorization possible. After four years, everything is still exactly the same. Yeah, I I feel like their general website top 10 has been relatively static for several years. Uh, I think the SQL injection attack is still like one of the number ones (laughs) or in the top 10 year after year after year, even though it's a very well-known attack. Right. Yeah, I I don't I think at a certain point, they're just going to change the name of the list to are you effing kidding me? (laughs) So yeah. I'm not gonna, I don't want to hit every single item in the list because there are some that are – they're variations on a theme and it gets a little too deep into the programming weeds. But sure. I have a couple of points to talk about that are in this list. And again, this is up for public comment. So if you are uh, either a researcher or a programmer and you find these things interesting or challenging, you can go to the linked GitHub site and post comments because this is not public yet. Or it's not right. final yet. I should say. So let's do it. Let's go with number one with a bullet. Again. Oh, a repeat. Security issue. Number one on the API security. Top 10 broken object level property level. Oh, shit. I said that backwards. Broken object property level authorization. And like I said, this one has been unchanged. For four years. Now, the list gives a tiny bit of a pass in the way that it's described because the definition has expanded slightly, but the problem is still the same. The request made to an API can be made to return more data than is necessary for the intent of the request. Mm. This could be something individual, like forcing the API to return an entire user's profile instead of just their username. Or it could be group-based. 
forcing the API to return itemized usernames and PII instead of just summary data. So if the question is supposed to be how many users are in group X, and you can manipulate the API into returning everything about all the users in group X, that is broken property level authorization. I see. In either case, the advice is the same. Quote, devs should be careful about query validation, unquote. Hmm. Now, the danger here is simple, and the advice that comes down to a very common old saw, security versus convenience. Oh, I feel like we've heard that. Developers before. want people to use their APIs. So sometimes they can be, shall we say, less than stringent when it comes down to nailing the responses and requiring really explicit requests. So being a little less explicit is good in terms of user adoption, but it's bad in terms of security, which is why it has been number one for four years. That was issue number one, broken object property level authorization. Any broad thoughts on that before we move on? Um, I'm just, I'm thinking about the newer introduction of GraphQL and the way that that might make, might exacerbate this problem because the nature of GraphQL is to include queries inside the request so that you can ask for exactly the information you want. And so if you don't have tight controls on the back end in terms of permissions for that request, it's meant to be more open in nature. So the, the, amount of abuse that can happen there is pretty high. Right. Yeah, and it's actually interesting that you brought up that specific example because in a couple of the articles that I used for research for this, that was brought up specifically. All right. Hey, I knew a thing. Woo! <laughs> I mean, it's right there on, I mean, and this is going to be a common theme, but it's security versus convenience yep. every single time. Every time. So let's talk about API security issue number two. That would be all the other authorizations. <laughs> so the number two issue on the list is a collation that is simply called broken authentication. Now, there are a few that are looped in through the list that also refer to authentication, but like I said, variations on a theme. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to kind of talk about them all at the same time for the sake of time and sanity. Now, in 2019, this issue, which was still number two, was called broken user authentication. Oh. Now, one of the reasons that this change was made and one of the reasons that I think it was a good change to make is quite simple. Automated connections. Right. User implies human. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a complicated thing that we in uh, technology have to get past, is that the vast majority of devices that connect to something are overwhelmingly larger in count than the number of humans that will connect to something. That really kicked in with the Internet of Things. I mean, it was already there, but the Internet of Things kind of just uh, exploded out in an exponential kind of way where you have, there's 9 billion humans on the planet, roughly. There's already more than 9 billion devices on the planet that are connecting to the internet. And that's all, that number's only going up. So if you think of it in those types of, of features, then yeah, focusing on machine to machine authentication is actually more important than user to machine. Right. And something else that has occurred in software development that also changes the nature of security is the concept of microservices mm. and especially elastically designed microservices, mm. which would require different security considerations. How do you make sure a connection is safe when the endpoint might have only begun its existence five seconds ago and will only exist for another 90? <laughs> the answer which is criticized by API security issue here, and <laughs> according to lazy developers, is by creating things like connection strings with no password, 
or tokens with an infinite expiration date. Hmm. These practices, while convenient, are bad. Yes. And that gets back to that seesaw, right? And there's a pretty good chance that the developer implemented that when they were just trying to get a feature working. I just want to make sure that the functionality is there. And then I'll layer on the security later. But no, they have to ship it tomorrow. And that security just never comes. So unfortunately, the solution has been pushed off to operational folks. And they have put elaborate things in place like uh, service meshes that layer the security on top so the devs, quote unquote, don't have to worry about it, even though they do. Right. And it comes down to the idea that this is like the foundational theory of things like DevSecOps, which is you build the security at every layer, at every step of the way, not bolt it on at the end and just say, oh, well, we have a firewall and deep packet inspection. That'll cover it. <laughs> Until it doesn't. Right. So. That's bad. Don't do that. Security issue number three. Here are some that were added to the list. Ooh. Now, there are a few that I'm going to skip over because they're pretty self-explanatory. Number seven on the list, again, is security misconfiguration. And, I mean, that's a good one. That's something we should pay attention to. Don't misconfigure stuff. That's my advice. You're welcome. That will be $900. Ned will be invoicing all of our active listeners. I, I hope you have, have a lot of paper in your printer. No, I already have it ready to go in QuickBooks. You'll get an email. Don't worry. <laughs> it's 2023. <laughs> so what is new to the list? Number one, ranking number six on the 2023 list is a, a banger. And it's going to take a little um, time to work through because it's not, okay. an, it's not an obvious thing. It is called server-side request forgery, or SSRF. Or I guess... That's completely clear. I, I yeah. It's on the server-side, and it's forging a request. I don't need any more information. But maybe our listeners do. <laughs> yeah, for the listeners. Let's back up. What is a request forgery? A request forgery is when an attacker can make you, as a user, request something from website A that is then redirected to website B. Therefore, you accidentally asked, you, you sent a legitimate request to the wrong website mm. because of the attacker. Okay. So here's the example uh, that happens on um, the user side. This would probably be more fitted to the main OWASP top 10 list, but just for purposes of description. Imagine you are logged into your bank account and you have an email tab open in your browser as well. You receive an email that appears to be from your bank, but is actually a malicious email from probably a different bank, let's be honest. You click on a link in the email the link takes you to a website that very closely mimics your bank's website. Now, in reality, that obviously is a malicious website controlled by an attacker, contains code that automatically sends a request to your bank server to transfer money out of your account without your knowledge. This is possible because your browser includes the authentication credentials like cookies, session tokens, etc., all of which are inadequately secured with every request it makes to the bank server. Admittedly, this is a unique situation, and for it to work, your browser has to be set up just right, the certain amount of tabs have to be open in just a specific way. But remember, this is a numbers game. Right. How many? You said there were 9 billion people on the planet, which is wrong, but I let it go. I'm just saying there's a lot of people, and if they spray and pray with something like this, eventually the attackers will have a situation where they can misuse those tokens for their own nefarious purposes. Right. So from a mitigation standpoint, you have bank websites that should probably set pretty low uh, expirations on tokens. Yeah. So, and the tokens should also not be valid for a cross-site attack. Correct. So that, that, that's part of the way that you can mitigate against it. But also, if you're the end user, you can use, well, if you're using Firefox, you can use something like the sandbox feature in Firefox to launch your bank website in its own sandbox. And so tabs launched in the regular browser won't even have access to those credentials. 
Right. Or if you're using a Chrome, you can do user profiles to keep them separate. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of options that are built into the various browsers, and depending on the browser you use, your mileage may vary. But that is a super good way to do it because effectively, if you have your cookies for your banking or whatever sensitive website in that sandbox, they are literally inaccessible to other websites that are in different tabs or different sandboxes or different user profiles. Right. It's funny. I originally used that for Facebook because I didn't want Facebook to have access to anything else. It was like right. keep it inside the sandbox. But then I realized, oh, I can actually use this as a defensive measure to keep my credentials and cookies in their own sandboxes so there's no intermingling. Right. So that is like, again, that's on the front end side, right? That's the user experience of this. Um, for SSRF, as it's described in the application top 10 or API security top 10. It's the same idea, except it happens in the, in the plumbing in the basement instead of in the lobby. Mm. And again, it comes down to if an API fails to constantly validate the data that is sent to it and make sure that all of the information is legit, it'll be vulnerable. So, you know, cross-site scripting is, is a great example. If you have uh, an API connection that comes from, I don't know, uh, New Britain, Pennsylvania, and it's been running steadily, uh, connecting with with a username and password that is legit. Then all of a sudden, that same exact password and or combination and authentication is redirected to, I don't know, Russia. That's going to be a problem. Like even though you have the correct authentication because the ticket or the token is valid or the credentials are are legit, um, you know, it comes down to like impossible travel in conditional access in Microsoft um, in Intune. Right. Apply that to the API. The same thing can be the same security can be um, achieved. Right. And that's actually something we'll get into in one of the lightning round articles. Neat. Yeah. Synergy. So. Convenience versus security. Blah, 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 blah. Next. OK. And. I'm going to end the overall breakdown here because unlike Ned, I have respect for our listeners' time and patience. Clocking in at... Don't shake your head at me, young man. <laughs> Clocking in at number eight is another new category. Quote, lack of protection from automated threats. Hmm. Now, I know what you're thinking. Surely this is not an issue any longer. We've known about the dangers of automation since the 1920s. I saw Metropolis, you're proudly saying to yourself. I get it. But alas. Oh, alas. Wow. To take a uh, issue directly out of the news, remember, as recently as November of last year, everyone's favorite website, Twitter, was hacked, utilizing an API vulnerability that was only feasible using, drumroll please, Automation. Ah. Essentially, the API allowed a connection, millions of connections. One connection made millions of requests over a period of hours that pulled down PII for a huge amount of users. The actual number is still up for debate. Mm -hmm. This behavior should not have been possible. Full stop. The fact that it was is the type of behavior that caused this category to be created. Now, not... Twitter specifically, but as everybody's favorite punching bag, I thought I would bring it up. Fair enough. So you don't think this is important, perhaps. Well, think about it this way. Remember the last time you got up to buy concert tickets in a reasonable way? No. <laughs> I didn't think so. No. For years now, bad actors have been using botnets to buy up every ticket you have ever heard of. Before actual fans ever have a chance. Mm -hmm. So scalpers are the bad guys, right? I mean, they're on the list of scum of the earth. Like it's a sliding scale, but. Right. I the mean, name is, on there. is like, clearly. Oh, oh, <laughs> they, hmm. New episode idea. Dante's Inferno, except IT scumbags. I guarantee scalpers are on the list. Mm hmm. But the websites are guilty too, and the connections that those websites uses could have controls in place. Now, 
I know that everyone out there is shocked that I would imply that Ticketmaster was anything but integritous. There's a joke that only two of our listeners are going to get. But it's true. And this is why this item is on the list. Ticketmaster, as the developer, fails because their API allows this kind of behavior. So take all that and drop it down into the plumbing level. That's what this one is about on the list and why it's so important that it is new, that it justified being a new category. Right. And so in this particular case, this could be solved by doing some sort of some form of throttling. But the problem yeah. you have with botnets is they're able to come from what seem to be a whole swath of different public IP addresses. So it's hard to say with certainty that all of these connection requests are bots. So it's going to be a little harder to mitigate, but. Yeah. I mean, that's a valid point. And one of the things that you're always going to see is whatever the security is put in place, the attacker will find a clever, creative way to either manipulate something else, find a way around it. You know, one of the things that's happening, Ticketmaster is trying to tr put something in place to try to make it harder to sell scalped tickets. Um, and what hackers have been doing instead is selling the entire Ticketmaster account. <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, it's, it's terrible. like you just, it's got to be a slow clap for that one, right? I mean, <laughs> so I'll buy up the tickets and then I'll just sell you the, the account credentials and you can use them. Right. Wow. Just well done all around. But, you know, I think it's interesting and it's worth, you know, fighting the good fight. You can't just go back and say, well, everything's going to be awful all the time. We have to do what we can to stem the tide. And even though a lot of this stuff is not something that directly relates to my life, I am not a programmer. Um, I only tangentially understand a lot of what I just said. Mm -hmm. But it's important that we know, you know, t you put light on the shine light on the situation so that the people that are capable of doing something about it know what to look for, know what to go after, and know what to try to fix. And maybe, just maybe, some of these things won't be on the list next time they put it out. <laughs> You're cute. Lightning round? Lightning round. All right. TikTok Bill forgets to mention TikTok. Never ones to waste a crisis to make a naked power grab. Our delightful Congress has drafted a bill that would ostensibly be used to ban TikTok. Absent from the language of the bill is any actual mention of TikTok, but the implication is there. The actual language is so vague in general that it could be used to ban nearly any technology product or service and make a VPN illegal to use. Rather than this being a bug of the lawmaking process, the more cynical of us see it as an opportunity for the government to ban any technology that they take a dislike to. And considering the hallowed halls of our nation's capital are packed to the gills with geriatric Luddites who fail to grasp even the most basic components of technology, this is bad. All it takes is a couple well-funded lobbyists to weekend at Bernie's, the current or future Secretary of Commerce, and we'll be up to our earlobes in banned apps due to, quote, national security. I hope you felt the air quotes there. Efforts to circumvent such bans would also be illegal, potentially making the use of VPNs also legally questionable. It's just another instance of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, setting the house on fire, and nuking the neighborhood from orbit for good measure. Because freedom. Product that lets you open your garage door over the internet. You guessed it. Yeah. So, again, why? Why do things like this exist? Why would you need to have a solution in your life that allows you to open your garage door over the internet? You've already got a way to open the garage door from your car, which is, generally speaking, when you're going to want to open the garage door. You don't need to do that shit from, like, Walgreens. Yeah. Anyway, 
home automation company Nex, that's spelled with two X's for double the something. Not security. (laughs) Nex has a product that allows you to open your garage door from an app. That app is completely insecure and has been hacked by a security researcher who responsibly told Nex about it. Nex promptly did nothing. After months of silence, the security researcher went public, and, well, here we all are. The attack appears to work, because the next app shares information about every other device in the time zone. Reverse engineer the traffic that's coming in, you grab a code, and you can legitimately open someone else's garage door. Mm. Cool. Cool. The report goes on to say that other Next products are also vulnerable, with the researcher saying, quote, disabling the alarm and turning on and off smart plugs is pretty neat, too. Neat. Oh, dear. Data centers are going nuclear. Nuclear. A breathlessly positive article from Data Center Dynamics delves delightfully into the promise of small modular nuclear reactors for data center power. Now, they rightly point out that data centers are power-hungry beasts that have maxed out the capacity in several regions across the globe, with Ireland being a prime and recent example. In addition to power grid issues, the cloud hyperscalers behind those power-hungry edifices also espouse concern feigned or real, about the environmental impact of their megawatt monstrosities. While wind and solar can help ameliorate the the impact, they are still reliant on the existing grid and do not provide the consistent power required to run the data centers. The article goes on to poo-poo any kind of energy storage solutions that might mitigate the issue and goes on to extol the virtues of small modular reactors, SMRs. That can produce up to 300 megawatts of energy with minimal environmental impact, allegedly. The SMRs can be co-located next to each data center, removing the burden on the grid. While I agree broadly with the concept, there's also a lot of nuance that the author completely ignores. And there's also the fact that so far, no SMRs have been deployed in the United States And as we've covered previously, the first one was approved this year and won't be in operation until 2029. Privacy nightmares continue to rain down on the public in a country with few meaningful data privacy laws. It's a twofer, a lightning round twofer. First, Tesla got dinged for, wait for it, privately and illegally accessing drivers' vehicle videos, sharing them internally on the company's chat tool to make fun of their own customers. Sounds right. Now, the Tesla Terms of Service claim that user privacy, quote, is and always will be enormously important to us, unquote. (laughs) Tesla's behavior makes this, of course, garbage. Now, this behavior has also been happening for years, with employees basically laughing at people being upset about the privacy violation, saying that they should have expected it. The videos included such things as users being dragged by their vehicles and one of a car hitting a child riding a bike. (sighs) Yeah. That's exactly the kind of thing I'm expecting my car's company to be using, you know, as a meme for a laugh. Yeah. Elon Musk predictably had no comment, most likely because he was too busy enjoying the memes. Next up, an online alcohol recovery company called Monument admitted to sharing personally identifiable data with advertisers. This PII included names, dates of birth, email and physical addresses, insurance information, photographs, appointment information, survey responses submitted by the patients. Wow. Monument is calling this a breach that happened because of, quote, third-party tracking systems, which is, of course... Also garbage. The breach has also been happening for a period of time, at least since 2020. This was negligence at best, and willful and cynical abuse of the confidence of people who are struggling, at worst. To make matters more worser, they recently bought another similar company that had been doing the exact same thing since 2017. When is it that we're going to get that data privacy bill of rights again? Exactly. 
Mm. Operation Cookie Monster is a real thing, and InfoSec professionals are children. (laughs) By which I mean they're curious and fun, but also immature brats who lash out unexpectedly at the smallest perceived slight. What do you mean by that? Despite the ridiculous name, Operation Cookie Monster was a multi-year joint effort between the FBI and other law enforcement agencies across the globe to infiltrate and bring down the Genesis market, a website that provided impersonation as a service to would-be cyber criminals. Impersonation is the process of recreating a client's unique browser fingerprint and session cookies to hijack an existing client session with a given site. Hmm, that sounds familiar, like something we just talked about. (laughs) By successfully imitating an authenticated client, attackers can circumvent the security controls in place, such as two-factor authentication and risk-based assessment. In partnership with Have I Been Pwned, the FBI is making available a listing of everyone impacted by the Genesis market. You can simply go to haveibeenpwned.com and select the Notify Me option. The site will validate your email address and let you know if the records from the FBI contain your email and what information was included. Amazingly, none of my email addresses were included from for the Genesis market, but it looks like Park Mobile and I might need to have some words. Samsung. Samsung? Samsung. Samsung. Ooh, dim sum? Woo. Let's just go get lunch. Okay. Samsung engineers shared top secret data and source code with ChatGPT. Let's call this one the oopsie of the week. One story that I'm guessing we're going to hear a variation of quite a lot in the coming years. Samsung had a policy allowing their users access to ChatGPT for the purposes of, among other things, accelerating code development. Employees, in their haste slash unremitting pressure from above to pick up the pace, used ChatGPT for all that it was worth. That included internal source code, meeting notes related to hardware and future plans, and test sequences used in identifying faults in chips, all put into ChatGPT to try to find improvements. ChatGPT just went ahead and took that data. Hmm. Like they clearly state they will do in their terms of service. Meaning that Samsung has no real recourse here. That data is now the property of OpenAI and will be used to train the models. Now, on the one hand, ChatGPT does run behind the times, right? We're still running off of a 2021 data set. So the secrets are safe uh, ish. On the other hand, ChatGPT just had an outage because people noticed bugs in the service itself that allowed users to read other users' chat histories. Mm. So I guess it's a double oops. Samsung is now apparently investing in their own private version of GPT to stop these kinds of things from happening, which is probably what everyone's going to do sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, just remember, kids, Treat these GPT-type chat clients like Facebook. The truth is definitely subjective, and there's no such thing as privacy. I feel like we need to uh, create a startup for locally hosted GPT for all these enterprise clients. Trademark. Yeah. I suspect what's going to happen is there will be one that does the training for you, and then they dump the data so that it returns answers from the training set, but it's the training that takes all the, the... the smarts and the computational power. Right. So you can sort of rent out a training model. Yeah. Hmm. Food for thought. Hey, thanks for listening or something. I guess you found it worthwhile enough if you made it all the way to the end. So congratulations to you, friend. You accomplished something today. Now you can go sit on the couch, accidentally log into your bank account and your insurance company at the same time and pay yourself or something. You've earned it. You can find me or Chris on Twitter at Ned1313 or at Hainer80, respectively, or follow the show at chaos underscore lever if that's the kind of thing you're into. Show notes are available at chaoslever.com as well as the sign up for our newsletter. You should do that. 
because we need more people reading our ridiculous nonsense. We'll be back next week to see what fresh hell is upon us. Ta-ta for now. So Zencaster, huh? Yeah, it seems like it went super great. Yeah, real good. I blame you. That's fair. Okay. I'm going to go have a hot dog. Ooh.